Hello, my name is Nathan Barr, and I'm here to teach you about the basics of game creation through the game loop. The purpose of this presentation is to teach you how to use the embed and the game loop. When I first started learning how to create a game, I had no idea where to begin. It took me hours just to figure out where to start. And I'm not the only one. I had many classmates who were also working on game development. They had no idea where to start. Because of this common issue, I decided to create this presentation to help enlighten other people. The game loop exists in every game, from Pong to Call of Duty Modern Warfare. While certain game engines, such as Unreal Engine 4 or Unity, don't manually allow you to change or see the game loop, it exists. The only difference with game between game engines and the embed is that the game engines do the game loop automatically and the embed makes you do it manually. Because the embed makes you do it manually, you must know the basics of what it is and what to do in each step so that you can properly create a game. As you can see here, the game loop starts with hardware initialization which is only read once. Then you go to read the inputs so that you will know what to do. Are you moving left or right, up or down, are you pushing a button? After that, you will update the game based on your movement. Are you moving into a wall? Are you, are you actually able to move? Are you pressing a button that does an action? So you need to do that action. After that, you will render the game in which the game is actually, you can actually see the change in the game. This is when everything is drawn. After a render, you might do a game over check to determine whether the game is actually ended yet. And lastly, you will use a FPS limiter to make sure that your FPS is consistent throughout each iteration. After that, you go back to the read inputs and start it all over. Without hardware initialization, the embed and the code will not be able to speak to each other. For example, if you push a button, then the code will have no idea because it can't read that input. So one example of how to create the button pin is by using digital in and you specify the pin so that this way we get a digital in variable that comes from the pin. After the hardware initialization comes the reading of the inputs. In this step we only read the inputs, we don't do any actions. When reading the inputs Precedence is very important. Typically, buttons take first precedence because if a button is pressed, it doesn't matter if you're moving forward or not. We're trying to do an action. After, a, after the check for a button occurs, we determine if the player is moving. Within movement, there are the X and Y axes, at least for a 2D game and those axes must also have a precedence order. Many games typically do a Y precedence over X, and as you can see in the diagram, I have also done a Y precedence. Um, it appears to be an X precedence, but because my, M my accelerometer is sideways, the axes have actually been flipped. So if you were to look at the embed normally, AX is the axis for Y. After we read those inputs, we update the game based on the inputs. As seen in the example, after three steps are taken, the rotation of the guards will change, which means every three steps, or every third time we read a step, this function will occur and change the rotation of the guards. 
in the images you can see how the the rotations change as the steps are taken during the render game state we will render in or draw the images according to our code for example if we want to draw in this alien as seen on the presentation we would this would occur, this would occur during the render game state and we would draw in using ulc.blit with the positions when we're drawing we also we always must specify the top left pixel as the pixel we're drawing at so the x start and the y start would be the top left pixel of the sprite the reason for this clear the screen, then show that the game has ended with a series of texts. Afterwards, we break out of the game loop and end the game. The reason we have a separate game check, game over check, instead of just doing it in the update is because we want this to occur after the rendering. We don't want the game to just end without the player knowing why. Instead, they can see how they died, and then it will end. This makes the game flow much smoother and is necessary for a proper game. Clunky. As seen in the basic game loop with emphasis on FPS limiter example, we created a basic FPS limiter that will make sure that each frame takes 20 milliseconds at the very least. This allows the game to ensure that each frame will be around the same time. However, if a frame is longer than that 20 milliseconds, there is no decreasing its time or anything. This can still create some clunkiness. Because of that, we created a more complex dynamic FPS limiter that creates a variable FPS limiter based on the given frame time for each frame. This means that if, if one frame takes 20 sec milliseconds and the next takes 25 milliseconds, our FPS limiter will now be at 25 milliseconds. This allows the game to account for changing FPSs and it also makes it so that the game is not does not have to adhere to a single fps